Boards, games, boards, games, it's what we're talking about. Boards, games, boards, games, I'm not gonna shout. I am starting off this streaming with a little bit of singing. And over here, some people around me to talk about how to integrate, integrate games visually. There is our new person, Charlie, who has helped many games visually with painting and thinking and all sorts of things that we might talk about briefly after I sing. And Alan and Matthew and Rita too. These faces should be familiar to you. We'll talk about board games and visual design. It's what we're talking about. Board games and visual design. I'm not gonna shout. Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good whatever it is, wherever you are. This is episode 349 of Busy Beats and Board Game Blether. I'm streaming at 10 a.m. UK time for the next 51 days. And today we have with us Alan, Rita, Matthew, Charlie. I don't know why I put it in this particular order. We're having a deep pondering into the integration of visuals. And hello to me. It is lovely to see you as always. And let us go round and can we have a quick introduction of ourselves, starting with Charlie and going roughly clockwise? Um, okay, well, I am a designer of um, uh, live action uh, role play games, uh, free form role play games. Um, I am also Alan's other half. Um, the better one, the better one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I tend to um, pull him up on all sorts of graphic problems and all sorts of graphic issues because uh, it's not something he tends to think about nearly as much as I do. Um, and I also organize um, get togethers with um, uh, designers, play testing sessions, general self help sessions, um, that kind of thing. And I'm Alan. I'm the other half. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I'm a designer. I started designing when I was young. Um, and now I'm old. Um, and you talked about me far too much. So, yes, that's me. I'm a designer. And I do war games stuff. And Kingmaker. Uh, yeah, I'm. Matt Dunstan, I'm a, a game designer, uh, currently based in Prague, Czech Republic, although I was based for quite a long time in the UK and, and got to spend some great playtesting sessions with Alan and Charlie and experience Charlie's amazing uh, cooking, uh, catering as part of the special special event, uh, which, I, which I definitely missed that, that camaraderie, but yeah, and uh, streaming uh, a bit now and yeah, various things like that. I'm uh, Rita, I'm also a board game designer, and I'm very happy to be here every second week. I mean, I think it's every week now, because one yeah. week we come on Tuesdays, and yes, then one week yes. we work on games yeah, together yeah, with yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, um, oh yes, and we need to talk together in case I get a chance to try out dinosaurs tomorrow. But this Got is you. a... Um, dinosaurs love spicy pies, the game that oh, Rita says and I oh. are working on together. Oh, we need, oh, we need to play that. Yeah. Well, Drop everything, okay. let's play dinosaurs. Like, <laughs> I think it, it's worth um, paying a special thanks to Charlie, who's the irregular and first time comer to my stream. So thank you very much, Charlie. It is lovely to have you. I have talked about Alan, Rita, and Matthew in an extended way. And just to, I personally got to know Char, I think I got to know Alan first, technically, through the redesign competition. And then I got to know Charlie through that. And 
Now, our friends, and back in the old days, by which I mean 2019, uh, we used to, you know, go off to Essen together for a few years. That was a lovely thing. And um, I was very, I very much enjoyed some of the designer things that we, I got to be a part of, some of the designer meetings at your house. And everyone here is a game designer because although your medium is a bit more freeform, a bit more of the games that allow you to express yourself a wee bit more rather than games where you're strictly trying to win in some manner. Yeah, no, you don't generally try to win the kind of games that I design. <laughs> That's not what they're for. They're for te storytelling. Mm. They're, not, they're not for winning. Oh uh, yeah, we've... There, there really isn't a concept of winning in a um, in a freeform role play. I don't think. I've been in several freeform role plays where I know I'm going to have died by the end, and it's, it's uh, how, but that's it's what how you, you die. It's how, it's how you, you die. die. It's not whether you die. It's what the story is. Yeah. <laughs> and some of I heard about this amazingly ambitious project across the universe, which I never got to be part of but where you had games within games with a simulation within the game, but then a game within that game within that game with something made by David Brain within the simulation, I believe. Yeah, um, true, yeah. And <laughs> you had so many different writers collaborating to make this, but um, we don't have time to um, get into all the amazing pers amazingness of the person that is Charlie Paul. I do want to give a quick hello to Jeroen and thank you for joining us. Let us move on. We are going to, of course, talk about integration of visuals from a design perspective. At what point should you start thinking about this? How can you try and make sure you're setting yourself up for success without necessarily spending too much time and money on this? We do have some questions, but if you have related questions, then feel free to comment, ask questions along the way. But as always, we will get to the regular bits, starting off with recent highlights, recent highlights, living life and seeing the sights, recent highlights, recent highlights, playing games and other delights, recent highlights, and a random shuffle, so we're always going clockwise. So, recent highlights, what have been some of your recent highlights? Matthew, Dunstan. Uh... <laughs> I wasn't ready to be first. Uh, oh, sorry, that was a terrible choice by me. Should I? No, 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 um... no, no. Uh, yeah, skip, skip me quickly here, and then I'll come back. Also, yeah. Okay. Are you? Do you want to go first? Okay. Go My recent highlight was we got to go swimming again. Oh, oh, that was great. We we went swimming last Saturday, which is the first time we've been allowed to since after lockdown time. Oh, and yeah. it was brilliant. And it was so nice to be back in a pool again and just yeah. doing something like that. That I was so yeah. I was so surprised at how much I I mean, I, I, I like so Charlie's great swimmer. Um, I and I I do quite like swim. I was surprised at how much I really loved actually going to swim. When you haven't been swimming for over a year and you get back in the pool, and just it go. So it's just so nice. Fun. Even just swimming lengths was absolutely yeah. fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're muted, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew, you are muted Oh, I said that sounds lovely. And a quick hello to Robin. It's lovely to see you. And a quick hello to Nicholas. Feel free to chime in with your own recent highlights. Um, I've had successful Kingmaker tests, hurrah! Uh, I had a really, really, really good test on, um, when was it? Sunday. God, all that time ago. Yes, yeah, <laughs> Sunday. Um, uh, we got a new, a new play tester who's like one of the top Kingmaker tournament players from the States who, who joined in. He, he was good. Uh, and that was a great game. I actually, because unfortunately we had a player drop, which one of the real problems of running online playtesting is that um, you have to handle the, the the problem if somebody actually drops at the last minute because sometimes they have technical problems or whatever uh, and they just don't make it. Um, and so I actually played and yeah, that was really good fun even though I got absolutely slaughtered in the last big battle. But, you know, as a developer, I'm figuring I shouldn't win. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was good. Now, that was a good highlight. And Matthew's back. Oh, I'm up. Yeah. So yeah. No, sorry, I had to check something. Um, yes. Well, one highlight, which is not game related, was that I 
finally found a really great local bakery, uh, which kind of made me feel a little bit more like I'm an actual local in my neighborhood in Prague. Um, or I found it with my with my partner, but uh, you know, it's one of these kind of like uh, just little um, tiny little places that you know only open on the weekday kind of thing, not not a supermarket. Which is a very strange thing, but I uh, it was it sort of made you feel made me feel a little bit more. Uh, like I'm part of the place. Um, obviously, with with the last year and a half, it's been hard to really feel like you're actually part of a community or or anything like that. And I I very abruptly changed my situation at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and on game side, I have um, nothing to do with board games, but I have got thoroughly addicted to Stardew Valley, which I, I know I'm very late on to the train of that because it came out. I think actually just recently they celebrated five year anniversary, so it's a it's a digital, it's a video game where you're, you're. it's a very relaxing kind of like farming RPG, I think they call it or, or something like that. Uh, but I played it so much that I actually uh, have, have had to have a break because my hands were hurting too much. So <laughs> at the risk of, of getting RSI, I've, I've, uh, I've given myself a week a week off. So uh, hopefully I'll stick to that. But it, but it's it's really excellent. I'd really recommend it to, to anybody to give it a try. They like video games. I mean, I've specifically not played it because I know that Harvest Moon, Stardew Valley, this is the kind of thing that I could get sucked into so easily. Yeah, so, I've, already, I've already, I don't know what the hour, I've played something like 50 hours over the last two weeks or something. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, you can lose a lot of your time. Addicted. <laughs> yes, well, so much to the point where I medically had to, you know, take, you know, take myself out, and uh, I've never had any problem with like RSI or anything. Thankfully, in my, you know, I've worked a lot of, at a computer, uh, a lot, but uh, no, it was just something about this particular game got me. So I've tried to, yeah, scaling back. <laughs> well, um, enjoy yes. your week away from Stardew Valley. <laughs> Uh, my recent highlight was. Oh, are you finished? Oh, sorry, Matthew. Yeah, my, my recent highlight was I played a classic. Um, I played Abluxen from uh, Michael Kiesling and um, Kramer. You, is, is it called Abluxen in? Yeah, well, in, English? It, it, in English they called it Linko, I think. But you, they also were selling Abluxen copies for, for quite a while. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was it was very very funny, and uh, everybody recommended it to me, and I played it. Is that a card game? Is that right? It's a card game. Yes. I think I've played it with. Um, I think we played it with Richard Reese. He loves that game. I, think. Yeah. I, think I don't so. know. I don't re yeah. recognize it. Yeah, it's a really great uh, sort of trick like a sort of a take on a trick taking game um, sort of uh, slash sort of laddering game uh, you know uh, but really yeah it's a pity it didn't get not I don't think it got nominated for Spiel or anything of it or it could have you know it was that kind. Yeah. Yeah. I remember at the UK Games Expo a few well whatever four years ago they were selling packs of phase 10 and a Bloxen together I think right. there was some deal to try and get it to sell or something like that. I remember it. I remember it. I think I played it for playing one session with Richard Breeze um, yeah, a while ago, and yeah, it was really good. And I, but we don't have it, so I haven't. One of those it. simple games where you can yeah. really ponder yeah. it and really get into the maths of it, if you so choose, and the probability management. But so definitely not a party game, I would say. No, it's an abstract card game, but. but Sufficiently light, you can get into it really easily. That's the app looks and yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. it's a classic yeah. number numbers on cards game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And another recent highlight was I played also uh, for me it's a classic because it's very old. I played this one. I don't know. Yet uh, jetzt schlägt. Jetzt schlägt zweizen. I've never heard of this. Yes, yeah. it, it was in the now, year. Uh, now, um, now hit thirteen. It it was in the year twenty seven on the um, recommended list. Spiel des Jahres. Oh, oh. Okay. and this is so funny, and it's from uh, Rudi Gadorn. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it, this is it's also a quick um, game, a little bit push your luck. And um, so um, you you take so when we have four players, you take four cards, um, and then you um, you show them, and then you have to give everybody a card, also uh, yourself, and you have to decide 
oh, this is a good card, but not so good. Who should I give it? And, and this is a little bit pushy luck, and it's very, very funny. Okay. Sounds yeah. A bit like, sounds a bit like Vantian. <laughs> <laughs> or like Biblios or something. Biblios also yeah. has that kind of core, yeah. you know, that, yeah, you deal out cards to your, your opponents and to yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to work yeah, out, do yeah, I? Yeah, yeah. Do I yeah. do I think this one is the best one I'm going to get this round, right. so I should take it, or do I think I'll get something better, so I'll I'll wait for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Good recommendations there, Rita. Thanks. Yeah. And Nicholas has helpfully put that into the chat, and I will pop that into the Facebook and YouTube in case um, yeah. people there are wanting to see it. I myself, I had a making dinner date with one of my parents, and we made a thing called Horesh de um, Carafs, which literally means the Horesh, which is a word that's untranslatable, but in the same way that curry and stew have the same kind of meaning, but very different connotations. It kind of means curry or stew or dish. So you could say it's the dish of the... Um, Carafs, oh, I'm how celery. Sorry, for a moment, um, struggled for English, terrible. But it had celery, it had a bit of mixed spice, it had a wee bit of turmeric, it had meat, it had lots of herbs, it had um, coriander, it had dill, it had mint, and it had a bit of rhubarb in at the end. So oh. Normally, there's a spoonful of sugar, but I asked for there to not be sugar added, and to me, it was still very nice i feel like the rhubarb gave it enough sweetness but is rhubarb, uh, is rhubarb an iranian thing an iranian thing or, or i'm not sure if it's traditional <laughs> but um, it's something the rhubarb is actually an addition that my mom might have tried and also the dill wasn't traditional it's normally just the um it's normally just the two herbs like right. two bunches of herbs but we added an extra style of herb because that was on hand. I'm the dill no. was kind of. Is it a lamb? Is it a lamb dish, Bez? Um, normally, yeah, lamb um, is the top sorts of things. That's really good. Oh my gosh! Um, and Nicholas says that apparently there, that was the wrong game. So just in so, case anyone's watching and oh, checking it's probably out. The English, English, and uh, so, so Bez, it sounds like you're eating it and then you feel completely healthy again it sounds amazing it, it is a really good dish i am um, i'm not a hunch and hello dutch Yoda. it is lovely to have you in the chat as always i'm not sure that i would be definitely able to make it myself right now but we, um we need also the there's a lot of very <laughs> slow slicing of the the way that yeah. the yeah. celery and the onions have to be sliced is very particular Oh, and I if know. I were making it myself, I might do it the lazy way. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I would, because you have to have a balance between how much is this really adding to the dish to cut the onions this way rather than this way. Oh, okay. Um, but it was lovely spending that time together. And yeah, got, that was definitely the highlight. Moving on, let's talk about the questionably quick questions. If anyone has any questions, then please get them in before we move on. And the first question that I always like to ask is, where are you? What time is it? Here it is 10.19. I am in Glasgow in Scotland, where I will be for a few days longer. Charlie and Alan, who are presumably in the same place. Yep, it is also 10.19 here. Uh, it and is. and we are in rural Cambridgeshire. Yes, mm. and it's, I was going to say it's sunny. It is. It is. It's, it's lovely. pretty sunny. It's, it's yeah. beautiful. Man. It's lovely. Yeah. You, can see, you can see the water tower, which is exactly 700 metres away. <laughs> Red. I'm not quite sure why. Matthew. I was, I was looking at ranges for things as I do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to cut you off about the water tower, Island. I know. It's, <laughs> you know I guess it's, 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 that's. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever seen the water tower when I've been there, so yeah, obviously it's not not had such great weather. Uh, it's it's eleven nineteen here in, in Prague, and it is actually sunny. Hard to believe that two weeks ago when we were on, uh, it was snowing actually. So uh, yeah, it's it's, it's a change. Anyway, 
Yeah, here it's also 11.20 and I'm in Munich and I don't know what the weather is because I can't see outside. You don't have a window in your office, Rita. I have a window, but um, the, it's closed, so no. I can't see anything. So firstly, good morning, Alex. It is always lovely to have you uh, join us. And there is a question just for me, which this is the appropriate <laughs> time for it, I guess, with the question be quick questions. So how are the onions cut for the dish? So first you need to slice the onion in half and then you don't put it on a chopping board. You need, basically need to slice it as thin as you can, but you don't slice. Um, let me see if I've got something that could be, imagine if this were a semicircle, even semi-sphere, even though it's clearly not. If you slice it that way, each strand of onion will have a lot more curvature to it. So uh -huh. to minimize the curvature, you kind of have it like that, and then you're cutting it whilst holding it in your hands and going around the onion and sort of shaving the onion, if that makes sense. Wow, this and is science. So it definitely takes a bit longer, but it means that in the end, the strands of the onions are a bit um, straighter. And what that means is because you're going to then fry these onions for literally about 20 minutes, just on a medium heat, so not just making them translucent like you might, but waiting until they're very brown. Not burnt, you know, just they've got a good bits of colour to them. And that's step one of so, the process. So next time you have to make a picture. Yeah, we, we need the recipe. Can we have the recipe? That would be really good. I fancy making this thing. That <laughs> sounds good. If, if you genuinely want, I will write it up on Facebook for you and I will yeah. tag you, Charlie. I, yeah, yeah. And Alan, both of you. No, I'll probably cook it. I don't know. No, Charlie might ask. Right? Might I probably will, yeah. Mm. Okay. Water. Can I do a... Wow. Okay, so there's a lot of comments on this. Um, can I do a live stream of it? Um, oh, that's asking quite a lot. So almost certain... You know, I was going to say almost certainly not, but... Um, Bears, you've got a cooking show here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, yes. If people really want, if, if 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 people really want it, express your interest somewhere. And if enough people are interested, I don't know. I norm, yeah. If we've got, I don't know how many people, but if there's enough interest, then maybe I can be motivated. There's <laughs> and um, Nicholas says, yeah. Chuck it. Chuck your requests into my Discord where there's a space for food. And Robin says, you can keep from crying while cutting onions if you cut them underwater. I tend to just give it a quick rinse before I cut them. That's what I do. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, so now a question for everyone. If you had to speak to a convention of experts on any non-tabletop topic for 60 minutes, what would you pick? So... Um, we're at a convention, there's experts in any given topic, and you have to speak on the topic that they are experts about. What do you talk to them about? Which, um, who's... Well, I mean, I, I would probably speak on systems thinking, because it's what mm. I've done quite a lot of in my... Should I, should I say professional life? I don't know, probably, yes. I would probably do something on system thinking. But then the trouble with that is I would stray, I would quickly stray into tabletop stuff because you can apply systems thinking to tabletop. So that would be a difficulty. Keeping off tabletop would be quite difficult. But systems thinking techniques, I would go for. Mm. Mm. I think I would run a mile before that circumstance happened. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine ever, ever doing that. I really can't. But if I did, it would probably to do some kind of arts subject, I imagine, some kind of drawing or artistic subjects of some kind or another. But I would be, there would have to be some serious, serious work on persuading me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean you go, Biz. I was just thinking that you don't need to necessarily be passing on information because they presumably already know all this information. Maybe you've just got something that you really care about. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe you're trying to effect change somehow. 
So I would definitely talk about dogs. Well, oh, right. Maybe dogs and cats, because I think in the audience, um, either you're a dog lover or you're a cat lover. Oh, no, we've lost yeah. Matt. That frightened Matt off. <laughs> yeah, so he... All four of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't you like dog or cats, Matthew? I, 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 did, I missed the, the question, so I don't know what I'm supposed to be offended of. <laughs> You're offended by the idea of dogs and cats, we joked. <laughs> No, the the la the stupid landlord. They, their office. They're doing this work for the last month, and they just randomly disconnect the internet all the time. So it's oh, a bit wow. annoying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, someone asked in the in the in the comments. Um, so I would I would tell funny stories because everybody who has a cat or a dog has to tell funny stories uh, what what uh, the animals did so yeah mm. it's a popular topic isn't it i mean you've got an, all, an automatic built-in audience who's talking about cats and dogs which is good yeah, it's true uh mine's uh, yeah i uh, i mean obviously in my professional life i've done a lot of this anyway as a scientist you know it's quite normal to go to conventions and, and talk about scientific research but Actually, my, I'm probably not going to be doing much of that into the future, but uh, my wish, which is sort of academic adjacent, is I'd love to present about um, academic culture and specifically about improving uh, group dynamics and, and group management uh, within universities, uh, like within the context of scientific research. Um, it's something that I am quite passionate about. I don't, and uh, sort of was even... My parents kind of got me into it because my father especially was involved in education, uh, but not just uh, directly in education, but in, in, in teaching teachers, <laughs> I guess is the point. He would run lots of courses for the for the Catholic schools department in all of Australia. And he went to Papua New Guinea and to Solomon Islands and, and all around. And uh, I see so many um, scientists aren't chosen to be managers. You know, you basically, you become a professor usually because you're a great scientist, but that doesn't mean you're a very good manager or a very good people person or a very good, uh, you know, lecturer or anything. And I think uh, there could be a lot done to improve, to help train uh, these people to, to essentially, because they're running small businesses effectively. You know, some, some my lab in, in Cambridge that I'm involved in has 50 people and, you know, has a multi-million pound budget, you know, each year. So, uh, but there's no training or no, you know, they're just sort of handed the reins and then, you know, expect to be successful. So that's that's my passion to sort of talk about that and, and to discuss with people about it. You know, organizational cultures are a really interesting thing. I'm reading a, I'm reading a book at the moment called Cult, The Culture of Military Organizations, which is looking at, well, military organizational culture, but through the lens of business organization culture. It's really quite interesting and how different um, national organizations actually have so different culture because of all those all those unspoken or even not a uh, completely unconscious assumptions that people make about how things operate really fascinating subject i'm not yeah. an expert at all. no absolutely and the other kind of interesting little quirk in academia especially is that everyone you know the idea of hierarchy is very uh, you know a lot of people right. in academia are very anti-hierarchy anti-middle management anti-administration uh, and everyone's sort of expected to be sort of independent. You know, even if you're a PhD student, you, you have control over your project. Someone can't tell you, you like, do this, you know. So you have this huge organization, but without a very strong, you know, sense of hierarchy or, or you know, obedience <laughs> in the mm -hmm. same way as, you know, like compared to, say, the military. You know? So it's, uh, it's yeah. interesting. So. We've, tried to, we've, tried to run, we've tried to run projects in universities yeah. with a mix of admin and academic staff. And that is, I mean... The one number one question is always how the hell do we handle the communications about this? Because they have a different understanding of a lot of the words you use because they, yeah. they um, literally have different assumptions about it, which is really yeah. fascinating. <laughs> Robin says that's a good point. My dad was an optometrist and he was lucky that he had a natural talent for business. Many optometrists don't succeed because of the business side of running a practice. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure the business side really matters in anything you do. I think no, the just... I've had teachers too in schools. They come up through 
teaching and they're good at teaching and then they're asked to be business managers yeah. when they suddenly get to be head teachers and i think a lot of them have problems with that too it's the same thing and it's not just business as well i think it's, there's also a, a sort of a pastoral or personal side you know when you think of, of student PhD students that the, the one thing I really think that determines whether a PhD student one of the major things is the quality of their advice and not so much in terms of the quality of the kind of research acumen but the the way that they can manage that relationship um, you know and and not sorry have I missed something or just <laughs> no um, just um, Alex is suggesting that maybe those head teachers need belts and rising through the ranks but I think that's getting away from the point that you're making that it's not just a linear you learn more and more about teaching it's that you need this completely orthogonal expertise and um yeah as robin says yes it goes for many professions and sorry as as i said and robin agrees i think it's better to say but um yeah it's all about when you're a game designer you need to have some awareness of how to pitch your thing. And that really requires some sort of acumen. And, you know, the fact that I asked on a Twitter poll, I think I had like maybe 40 people respond to it with saying, because I had an option, I don't actually hire people. And then of the people who hired people, almost 50% um, said, I expect to um negotiate then maybe 40 percent said i sometimes negotiate and maybe 10 percent said i don't negotiate and so that's of the people hiring you so as a person who's offering your services you need to be aware of that you need to you know be willing to enter this sort of negotiation which isn't the kind of thing that i like to do myself but back to the question not posed by Alex, I think inspired by Rita, I would give a quick motivational speech. If they're experts, I'm not going to try and educate them on what they're experts about. I'm just going to try and inspire them and congratulate them on all that they're doing. Maybe talk to some people who are experts on waste disposal or um, farming, I don't know, something where people might be doing something that's really critical to our humanity and it might be nice having someone just talk for 60 minutes saying hey thanks for everything you're doing for civilization you're doing a good job or some people who are doing something about energy i don't honestly i don't think the topic really matters but right now i'd pick um, some people who are experts in clean energy and kind of trying to motivate them to keep going for the sake of you know avoiding climate chaos well, I'm not sure. I've already failed. I've, I'm just leave. I'm slowly transitioning out of a, a renewable energy lab. So, <laughs> I needed your your uh, optimism earlier, maybe. <laughs> but Matthew, it's so important to the world. Come on, um, this is the kind of thing that can really change the way that the world is in a hundred years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. You just yeah. It's hard to see beyond the little that you're a little brick in a very very big wall. But uh, no, it, it, no, it is. I, I'm not, no. I'll always be interested in science. Yeah. Anyway, I, I mean, this isn't the um, let's get Matthew back into science show. I'm not saying I'm not forcing anything. But let's actually um, get to the main topic in a meandering, strange way, and let's talk about brilliant thing, brilliant thing. It's a little thing which is brilliant and so let's talk about visuals in games i mean why do visuals in games matter why are they a brilliant thing and let's leave your negativity at the door and points from the audience are of course welcome so charlie you have a vested interest in this why do you think it matters why do you think it's brilliant um I think that there are lots of different kinds of ways that um, graphics are used in games. I think there's um, box covers and things like that that are used for selling. And that's brilliant because people see them and they like them and they enjoy them and they go, oh, that looks good. I think I'll have one of those. Um, and that's a, that's a good thing um, for the game. But there's also the kind of things that give a game a theme and they give it a, a feel and a, an a atmosphere. 
Um, and you can create a real atmosphere in a game with with uh, good graphics, good images and things. And, and you can make a game feel like it's fun to play with or without. You know, even a game that has questionable rule set can feel fun to play if it's got a really good story in the in the graphics and then there's the graphics which are the ones that actually make the game playable sometimes certain kinds of games if the graphics aren't clear you can't play the game easily because you're not being told what to do easily your eye doesn't immediately go from one thing to another so when you get good graphics like that and you get a good game and it it's, makes it so much easier to explain a game if it's got good graphics on it and it makes it so much easier to do all sorts of things with a game if it's got good graphics on it graphics are wonderful yeah, yeah, well, yeah <laughs> there okay. you go yeah, everything good, everything in one everything go. in one I, go I, well i i brought this book along because i think this is this is this is this is my book of the fortnight if you like world war ii infographics by jonathan fenby i'm gonna read it um and it's about communication so i'm going to random oh it's going to randomly pick a page and of course naturally i picked a um page without good graphics uh, <laughs> there's a random, there's a, a page in that book without good graphics oh oh i've got a bookmark in here let's see if that works so we've got some um we've got uh oh, i can't see it now myself We've got some graphics and it's got things like um it's got things like oil i think it's about oil it's got how much oil there is <laughs> in each country it's got um graphics which show clearly how difficult it was going to be for uh certain countries to win if it, this, this is this is the number of military and at the top you've got the black for the germans in the middle you've got the Red for the Soviet Union um, and other countries. So you can see our allies at the um, allies at the bottom, axis at the top. That's just showing graphically the imbalance of forces mobilized. So, and so to I, side question: Does it show the change in opinion about Russia versus USA's role in the war? I find that fascinating, says Alex. Um, well, not it's not to do it. This is this is do, this is stats. So the, the, this is a method of communicating the information behind the the information and the assumptions behind the conduct of the war. So, and the important thing from my point of view of this is this: it's showing how graphics can communicate really mm -hmm. effectively. And so, uh, definitely, really showing what Charlie said about graphics bringing clarity to something yes yeah. and also with the way that those bold stark colors are represented it's also <clears throat> an exit with a sort of tone and theme itself there's a starkness to it appropriate for the subject matter so, so ellen how many books do you have Every every oh, every time we are we are um, we are chatting, I'm just reading a book uh, reading a book about this. Oh, I have here a book about this. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have quite an eclectic collection. Of books. Our house is completely full of books and board games, board yes. games and books. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, what is brilliant about graphics? So I, I think um, the important thing is it transports a feeling. So when you look at the box or inside, it transports a feeling. And, and it shows in which direction is a game. So is it funny? Is it, is it um, horror? Is it weird or something like that and it's also interesting we talked about that um from our game Din dinosaurs love spicy pies about the graphics and um, so we have now we have the graphic which is very cute and sweet and we want to change it a little bit more weird uh, and so in, it transports another feeling so i think it's all about feelings mm. Yeah, and setting expectations, that's a really good point. And Matthew, do you have anything left to add to everything that's been said? No, I don't think so. I mean, obviously there's a difference. I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk more about the difference between, say, illustration and graphic design and, and things like that. And, and uh, But for me, I think 
the thing I always think about with games that is brilliant, maybe more on the graphic design side of things. And and in some ways, icons, which can be a part of illustration and a part of graphic design. But yeah, their ability, much like uh, Alan's book, to, to sort of convey convey complex information, but also to be intuitive enough as to guide behavior and to guide play. Um, you know, there's there's a great power in the way that you're, you know, I think someone like Ian O'Toole, you know, is probably one of the best examples of sort of, I would say, current graphic designers, at least in the sort of hobby board game space, that I think truly understands the importance of how you arrange information uh, you know how you sort of space it out how do you what what the actual fonts or what the actual icons etc you know all these things that go into graphic design and illustration how they all help people play games actually beyond a rule set um you know there, there are so many things that sort of almost subconsciously help a player or can actually hinder a player if, in ter terms if the graphic design isn't that great uh so done well it, it's incredibly incredibly powerful and also somewhat sort of reaches across, you know, like age groups and, and even sort of language barriers and, and, and all these other things that might mean people have different uh, reactions to a game or different ways of comprehending a game. But but illustrations and graphics are, are, are not exactly universal, but are, are a more universal way of communication in, in some way, mm. which is fantastic. 100%. It's worth remembering that even those icons have, you know, some cultural baggage and something that might be appropriately represented by a spear in one culture should be a sword in another culture or um maybe this doesn't mean what you think it means somewhere or maybe this is actually a very rude symbol in some place because generally this is a very rude symbol in some places and but for sure it, at least Across Europe um, and the USA, there's a lot of things that are identical. And we've covered so much about covers leading to sales. It's something that brings people in. Like Charlie mentions, it is about, yes, you do want to have your game be sold. That's immersion, that clarity, that's emotion, setting expectations. So we've got a question from Designer Cardboard um, for... Well, firstly, Robin um, adds on, that's one reason why I think not all games should expect to escape language dependence. Completely indep um, language independence games might be slightly problematic. And Designer Cardboards takes a step back and says, do you think great art and an original theme can make a mediocre game great? And this is a slightly tangential Thing because for me, I don't think that these things are easy to separate. I don't think that if you have a mediocre game and then you just swap out bits of the theme and then you put in other things, well, that theme isn't really going to adapt itself. You have to integrate the theme somewhat. There has to be some work to do to make that theme suit it. And then, yeah, I don't... No. Can I can I just say something? I think um, Calico, you know Calico, the game with the cats mm -hmm. and the patchwork, it is a a, a great um, thing for that because just imagine Calico has another theme and doesn't look so beautiful and cute. It would be, it would be a very abstract game, and I think. Um, the, the graphic and illustrations of Calico are so important because th this makes the game beautiful and makes the, the, the people welcome to play it and it's a feel good game. Um, I would say that the um, graphics of the game, they can't make the game any better than the game is, but they can make you enjoy it an awful lot more. Um, so if it's a mediocre game, it's probably a mediocre game. But on the other hand, if it's been designed with thinking of um, good graphics and somebody's actually drawn some good graphics and made it made it work as well as it can with those graphics, like Calico has got these really lovely cats and, and so forth on it and made you inspired and interested in it, then you're much more likely to play it and, and enjoy it and, and have a good time with it. But I'm not sure that I would say that that necessarily makes it any better game. Uh, it's a bit of semantics there. Uh, yeah, but, um, <laughs> look, 
uh, I, I've been influenced a lot by Luke Osfer, um and his, his, his view was always that graphics aren't important. I mean, it probably takes it a bit more extreme than I do. I mean, his, his book, How to Create Video, How to Create Video Games and, and Tabletop Games Start to Finish, actually says graphics are therefore atmosphere, not for the mechanics of play. As far as how the game plays, graphics are largely irrelevant, though graphics may be important to the game interface for ease of use. But in the 21st century, many people won't play a game unless it looks at least decent. So, um, I mean, that's possibly a slightly more extreme view than most people would have. I think I think graphics are slightly more than just atmosphere. But I mean, I, when you say just are, atmosphere, isn't atmosphere a big thing? Like well, games, yeah. sure, games might be competitions, games might be expressions of self, games might be story engines, but the games that are expressions of self or story engines or experiences, those graphics, and I kind of agree with mm. Alex that there has, there has to be some beauty in what you're doing. Something like um, Go, if, let's say we were playing Go, and then we were playing with one person had pennies, one person had two pence pieces. That might work fine. But let's say I'm trying if the graphic design was done badly so that it was a jumble and you didn't have that um, clear something to distinguish my pieces from your pieces and it became a mental mess, then, you know, the graphics have to serve the game. The graphics have to give us clear information. The graphics have to pull us in. And, yeah, I would agree with Jay Foolsgard, who says, because I feel like games are, yes, games are the rules, but games are also the product design. Games are also the graphic design. And um, Robin asks if anyone has played Braggart, which is a very interesting question, given <laughs> that... Um, yeah, Vicky Dalton is the daughter of Alan and Charlie Paul. <laughs> um, but yes, and she I have. Did the artwork for yeah. um, but that's a really good point where this it's a game where it's about expression and the art allows you to do these things. The art directly pulls us into it. And if you look at something like Magidice or Rory Story Cubes, where the art kind of is the game, let's be honest. Do you know what I mean? I would say that um, it is perfectly possible to take a really great game and absolutely ruin it and make it completely unplayable by having really bad art with it. I, 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 I strongly, I'm not sure that you can make a, a mediocre game great, but you can definitely make a great game very mediocre. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, that's the I thing. Like, with that. I, disagree with that. I disagree with this comment that's on the screen here. I mean, yes, board games are a visual medium. I, I agree with that. But, uh, but, uh, but, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I still, I still, the, at the bottom of my heart, still think that the graphics are secondary. They're important, but they're secondary it, uh, for for quite a lot of games. You can have game Dixit, for example. In that case, Dixit probably the mechanics might be secondary, actually, yeah. and the artwork, <laughs> is the, the artwork is almost the whole game. But yeah. on the other hand, most most board games and war games, it's the it's the mechanics, it's the flow of the game that are are the most important, and graphics can support or not. That. I mean, but it's it. I mean, of course, you could get into. We could dive into so you know some weird rabbit holes because i mean it's almost talking about you know like ux or something like that like i mean or or, or you know, like you know we could have great ideas about what a game is but if nobody can actually interface with that if nobody can actually experience it if you can't share it with somebody else then is it still a game you know like is it if, if it's just an idea in someone's head uh and and certainly graphics and, and visuals are, are key to to be able to play it and to be able to share it um so yeah, I, I, maybe the, the real answer is not that important. I mean, I think we all agree that of the importance of, of graphics and visual and, and whether it is it is the game or not. Um, yeah, interesting philosophical discussions. And hello, Jeroen. It is lovely to have you join us. Thank you very much. And Alex, you know, we're all about the pretentious comments here. 
I think the game exists in the minds of the players and the graphics are the pathway the game takes from the components to the play. I can sort of see what you're saying there, but it's the visuals that then go directly into your, you know, minds. I mean, they are informing your impression of it. If my tactile experience, if my senses describe the world differently, it's going to inform my worldview in my head differently. And so, yes, in theory, if my imagination is good enough, I could play a game with the graphics in my head and I'm, they might be beautiful. But normally it's the role of the graphics, as you said, Charlie, to clarify things, as you read to like to set those expectations to inform us and to take a little bit of the work away from the players. No, no, you... no. Oh, sorry. oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, it's just an interesting point about graphics and illustration is that in some ways they're uh, impartial. They're not, compl uh, we've, we could talk about how, how it relates to cultures and things, but in terms of the players, they're impartial because none of the players themselves, you know, have ownership graphics. And interestingly, it come, comes out of linguist, like linguist theory. I, when I was at Cambridge, I had really great conversations about with a linguist there. And, and basically with language, we're always just trying to approximate our two things. Like when I say a word, we both have a meaning of what that word is. And we hope that we agree that that's the same, but of course we never do. And, and language is, is trying to bridge that gap in understanding and much like how we both understand a game, we're trying to, through the medium of, of, of the board and everything, we're trying to hopefully experience the same game. But good graphics uh, at least can, uh, you know, be something that exists outside the players' minds. That it's, it's, it's a kind of like this this anchor point that that all the players can can agree on. Hopefully, anyway. you, could, you could take the example of chess. Do people play chess in their heads? Well, people, people, friends of mine at school used to do it. Um, you play a whole game of chess. Now, there's a, that's a very interesting thing because to do that, obviously, you need to have a very very good understanding of the mechanics of the game, the flow of the game. But you know, I, I mean, for a lot of people. If you've got a, a memory which is geared to visuals, then the fact that chess is designed so well graphically really helps with understanding. So if you've got a picture of a knight in your head, chess knight in your head, you can easily see, oh, well, I know that piece. I associate the, the image of a knight in my head with the moving like a knight in chess, which is, you know, two forwards and one side or whatever, um, as opposed to a bishop, which is bad. So, I mean, the graphic design there and the simple, nice, simple black, white board or whatever really, really helps with remembering how you do things and associates very closely the mechanics of the game with your visual appreciation of it. However, other people will, will, are quite capable of, of, um, of imagining chess probably without, without the visuals. And some people might just look at it through the notation, through... through the, the movement notation. So there are people's brains work in different ways, but for me, certainly I think for chess, the graphics and the gameplay are, are very intimately associated, which shows it's a very, very strong graphic design. So this is a really good question. And Robbins asked the question about if there's any re-themed or redone games that are particularly interesting and designer cardboard mentions brass birmingham which the original version it was very flat colors and the newer version it's very illustrative and alex mentions glory to rome where the most popular version removed almost all illustration says alex but i'm not sure that's very fair to say i think it would be more correct to say it simplified all the illustrations and it made them more stark and it made them subservient to what to what else is going on and it's also about the tone isn't it but so i have a, a good example um i have the game lifestyle from amigo it is a very very funny um card dice game a little bit like uh yetzi but I, I think a lot more funny and it i think it it um doesn't uh, go very well because of the graphic and and the theme and illustrations 
because um, the illustrations were so ugly. So and what's the, the name? Lifestyle. And, and the theme is so... Um, it's all about having having money and it, it was it was a, a very boring old theme and with the illustrations so it completely um I, I was the only one who played that and no one has know this game because if you see the box you you uh, you see it and then mostly you will say oh no thank you um so and this is so yes and can you just show the cover Wes? because the cover is so ugly i will post a link for people to see the yeah. cover themselves it's funny as you were describing it reader i thought you were describing like quite an old game but i didn't realize this is so actually relatively yeah. recent like 20 yes yes it's i i don't know two three years old game 2018 I, yeah, I have it here. I can show you the cover. Oh. Yeah, definitely, definitely doesn't look like it was made and, four years ago. And um, the, let me just tell you what what it's what they uh, call it lifestyle my house my car my job and this is so 90s doesn't it look so 90s maybe they're going for the retro crowd or something you know <laughs> they're, they're trying to yeah you know, capitalism the game or something yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah but but uh, the game is cool the game is fun mm. yeah. uh, just yeah. thinking about something uh, matthew was saying just now um you can have the same kind of misunderstandings with pictures that you have with words um i remember um in a illustration um thing i was reading some time quite a long time ago um they were talking about an um, intelligence test um, that they've been trying to do internationally with a, a whole load of people and um one of the uh, pictures was a picture and it was uh, what's wrong with this picture picture and you had to just say what was wrong with the picture and it was a picture of um a boy carrying an umbrella and the rain was coming down from the inside of the umbrella instead of coming down outside it and being sheltered that way and almost everybody said that's what was wrong with the picture the rain's coming down inside the umbrella and there was one country where absolutely everybody said it's a boy boys don't carry umbrellas <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't remember which country it was now, but like everybody everywhere else is one answer, and that whole country just gives a completely different answer to that question because they're seeing the same picture and they're different, completely different things wrong with it. And so I'm thinking with graphics, yeah, 90% of the time I think you might be true what you were saying that graphics is, is a fairly universal language. But every now and again, people are going to see something completely different to it that you weren't yeah, expecting. It, it depends on the graphics or icons. Icons aren't necessarily um, transportable across cultures um, because because we have we all have we all have different iconic backgrounds. Mm. <laughs> um, so even even I think they've even found they've done some work on things like um, symbols for public toilets uh, that they do diff. I mean, in Europe. Europe and America is probably very similar, but in other countries, in other parts of the world, they have diff slightly different um, icons, which aren't automatically readily recognizable. You have to actually process the image more in your brain to work out what it means. Mm -hmm. um, Someone, so Robin brings up Small World versus Vinci, and um, they ch did change a few rules. They made it last a certain number of rounds as opposed to going up to a certain number of victory points, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, Robin suggests that the new theme is really entertaining and striking. For whatever case, it sold a lot more units as the new version. And Bones and Banners, hello, it's lovely to have you join us. Thank you very much. Says comic books get it right, having the writers 
and artists working closely together. When working separately, some of the magic is lost. And of course, yeah. in comic books, it might be a team of writers and then a letterer yeah. and then a separate illustrator and then an inker. And can we just talk about the game Carpe Diem, please? Uh -huh. Sure, if you feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tell us about Carpe Diem. Carpe Diem is a very, very, very good game from Stefan Feld, but it looks ugly. So ugly. I mean, and, it's not the only one of his games that looks ugly, so it should be a bit late. Yeah, <laughs> and, and now they changed the cover. So the, I think the cover now is um, very, very, very better than before, but they didn't change how the game, uh, how the the tiles look. So the, the game inside looks the same and it's still ugly, um, but um, they changed the cover, so. And also that game has one of the most egregious uses of color I think I've ever seen in a game where you're you're supposed to be able to tell the difference between two extremely similar shades of green in order to be able to sort out yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a very big problem. And I Which don't I know actually, why they did that. Is it still is it fixed in the new version? Have you seen that or not? It's it's a little bit better, but it's still both green. And yeah, I don't it's... know why why they can't use other colors. Because yeah, it, it's it, it. I was it's very surprised. So, also, an interesting uh, mathematical. This is an image oh, yeah. from twenty twenty one. Yeah, this that's is the new, new cover. One, yeah. yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. new one. Also had the the distinction of funnily having a bit of graph theory problems in the first edition, where uh, they presented a way to play the game, uh, which was essentially a graph is just an interconnected set of points. Sorry, mm. it's like my mathematics thing, but. You, you had to move around a star and somebody pointed out, well, that's exactly the same as just walk, walking around a circle. And then I think they realized that, they, anyway, sorry, we're getting, but it yeah. actually is kind of like, it, it is graphic information and how do you think about, how does that influence how you play? But, uh, but the, the good thing in this, even you have an ugly game, you can be nominated for Keller Spiedes <laughs> Isn't that a, a, a good thing? Yes, I, I've, <laughs> I've I've lost a Kenneth Bielders Yaris to a to a beautifully illustrated Alea game too, so I know I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, Alicia. Alicia was very beautiful. I have to say. Well, yes. I mean, I, I yeah. Anyway, we went. Uh, yeah. To, anyway. To, to, yeah, anyway. So, um, I think what we basically determined is that if the rules are mediocre, then you know there's a limit on how good they can be. And something like, um, oh, Azul, I'm just trying to think. That's, you know, a really solid set of rules. Yes, it's abstract. And yes, if the graphics were just solid blocks of color, then it would be less interesting. But yes. as an abstract game, it is actually an interesting, well-designed thing. And so it's just that the graphics allow it to reach the potential. It's almost like, which is your bottleneck? Are the rules being your bottleneck? Or are the graphics being the bottleneck? And if whichever of them is worse, that's kind of capping the quality of the game. Would you broadly agree with that statement? You can never use just plain colors if you if you want to actually um, attract certain members of your potential um, audience because there are going to be colorblind people out there. Well, you never use if you had black and white colors. and gray. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you want it to be entirely monochrome, I suppose you could could do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, you always have to think about people who have uh, visual issues. Yeah, definitely. But for, even, even in prototypes, it's kind of yeah. Mm. And I think that's a very in way, good way to bring us back to when you're designing a game, when you're in the early stages, you've not yet pitched it to a publisher because this is not a conversation about how important is graphics and visual design in a published game once it's been published? This is hopefully a conversation about how designers and visual artists, can, let's call them rule designers, and for clarity, and visual artists can work more closely together. Maybe you are both, maybe you're working on rules and visual design, how they can complement each other, and how much 
each person has to think about the other. So, Matthew, you wanted to talk about what's graphic design versus what's illustration. Um, shall we have a quick running definition of what we mean by that? And also, can we accept that we're just talking about visual design in general for this show, if that's okay? No, I mean, no, absolutely. I think I think a general discussion is always useful. And I, I, I'm not the expert at this. I feel like maybe I should throw to Charlie or, or someone. Is, but but my, my understanding of it is that, you know, graphic design is is a way of uh you know organizing and representing information uh and and how is that sort of spatially put on a board and how do you compose different elements together and the illustrator should is kind of the content what goes into the graphic design is you know is where i'm going to place an illustration of a particular picture or potentially you know maybe i don't know if, whether you consider an icon an illustration or a piece of graphic design or maybe it's it's really an in between of those two things but uh and and they are se certainly separate uh, disciplines. For example, my brother is a graphic designer, but he is not oh. an illustrator. Uh, so often, you know, in, in board games, um, sometimes you have people who really do do both. Um, as far as I know, Ian O'Toole is an example of someone who does do both. He is both yeah. an illustrator and a graphic designer, uh, but many companies. Both. Sorry, Charlie? Sorry, our daughter Vicky, Vicky Dalton, she does both. Yeah, and uh, although, and then, then on the other hand, some companies will hire separate people uh you know hopefully you want people to to work together and of course there's great there's great advantage if the same person is doing both because uh the illustration and graphic design can support each other and and and, and vice versa and everything but but they are different yeah i think graphic. i guess i think of graphic design as, as a way of rep representing and and sort of uh uh uh, organizing information and illustration as is sort of what you inject into the graphic design and inject and where you know and, and things like that Do you have anything to add to, well, Rita I, and then no, Charlie? I totally agree with Matthew. I agree. Uh, the, I mean, those are, in a sense, the, the starkest one of those the difference is that you, you've got um, box cover. Box cover can be a completely different person than the person who's doing the inside the box graphic design and illustration. Very can be, is. very often it's because the box cover is almost purely for marketing and isn't it isn't transmitting game mechanics type information, so it can be it can be a different person. I know with I think with Kingmaker, there's going to be a different um, box cover artist from from um, from inside the box. And so yes, I guess we're talking about graphic design, which is laying out the information, transmitting the information, and I think you know there's obviously ongoing discussions, and we could probably talk about the line between the two, especially if we had people like Rory Muldoon, another um, person who does both here and some a team of illustrators rather than, you know, mostly people who are focused on rules. But we are talking about visual design. Let's get to the first question that has lined up, which is, should a designer consider the, let, the visual design of the game? Or can a designer leave that up to a publisher? Let's go round clockwise for me. Rita, if you are. So what I'm, uh, when I'm making a prototype, um, uh, I, I try to, to have the theme and have the, the graphics as near as I can, I, I cannot, draw very good so i'm trying to transportate the best i can to the publisher because it depends on the publisher so some publishers are having the game and say oh no we put the other theme on it and we make new illustrations and da 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 da, da. but um it could be that um publishers are not that creative and they just take what you what you have and then they, they, they get an illustrator or a graphicer and then they they nearly do the same and so it really really uh, depends on the publisher that's why i always make my prototypes terrible so no publisher can assume that they would ever want to use the uh no i I'd say just but i but you do i think yeah, I think certainly Rita is right about um, 
in terms of some publishers will will closely hew to to your prototype and so there's there there probably shouldn't be a responsibility for the designer unless you are trained in graphic design or illustration because you would hope that a professional is going to bring their own expertise to that uh, but I would the thing I'd add to that is if you want to sell your you know so this is from the independent designer point of view and, and pitching to publishers then uh, you know I think graphic design potentially more than illustration is is important in that it just helps the publisher play your game that you you're going to show them or or even in a pitch where you might only have five minutes that's actually where you know effective graphic design and in some ways illustration um, can convey all of that kind of complex information very quickly and 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 some in some cases can be more intuitive than text or or even you describing the game uh, so if you if you sort of want to improve your your chances of, of a game being signed or, or a game kind of being understood by a publisher um, then then spending some time on that um, but uh, but I guess maybe we'll talk about this later but but without spending money don't spend money on illustration uh, but you know the the taking taking lessons from other there are a lot of other i think talented designers and graphic designers um who who have shared a lot of information i think of people like you know rory's been on on some podcasts uh uh some, someone like daniel solace who who's had a, a really fantastic blog for a long time um and does lots of videos about graphic design and things you can apply in your own work so yeah picking up on things like that i think is very useful uh, i i would i would say that well, my, my approach is that i I don't really consider art. I don't consider the art. And I don't consider the, the graphics in terms of graphic design. I will consider what the visual content might look like. So in a way, you could say it's a very, very, yes, I consider visual design, but only a very, very broad brush, shallow kind of way, because I'm not a trained visual person at all. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I'll use Charlie, because Charlie happens to be readily available um but it, it really does depend on the publisher i know, I know that quite a few publishers will, will quite happily look at what i might think of as a fairly sketchy prototype and they 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 might recognize this is a really good game and they'll do their own work on it i i am i am wary quite wary of believing that publishers are influenced a lot by how slick a thing looks graphically and I certainly try and try not to be because um, you can easily, as a publisher, um, we are and we publish as well. As a publisher, you can easily be taken in unless you're experienced by something which looks really, really good graphically, but actually is a mediocre game. And that's what you've got to watch out for as a publisher, um, I think. So I'm less, I'm less. I, I think it's less important to have really good art and graphics in a prototype even when you're going as far as pitching it but you do need to have enough of an appreciation of the visual design so that you can communicate what you need to to both your play testers and to your potential publisher and and where you draw that like it's a bit of a gray area where you draw that line will vary depending on the designers the design team and the publisher yeah my point actually was going to be um, the play testers rather than the potential mm. publisher because um, when you are trying to play test and um, develop a game um, and you've got a whole load of play testers around the, the table sometimes um, it's the kind of game which is um, fairly abstract with a theme slapped on top um, and sometimes you've got play testers who are used to doing a lot of play testing and think like that. Maybe they're designers themselves. Um, and that's not a problem. But if you're trying to get people to um, play a game, um, they will be affected to various degrees, depending on who they are, by the artwork, by the, yeah. the graphic design, whether they can actually pick it up and play it and um, come back to you with actual design um, comments rather than I couldn't play it because I didn't understand it type comments. Um, it, it's, it's a whole other thing. And I think it depends very much on the kind of game as well. Um, because some games, I mean, <laughs> Dixit's an obvious example, but there is very much more, there's, there's a whole uh, range mm. of things from ones that, don't actually need all that much right through to ones that really can't be played without it. I mean, I'm actually thinking about um, 
Plus, and some of the visual speed games that I was working on, maybe around the turn of the 20s, by which I mean a year ago. Um, and <laughs> But, yeah, Alan and Charlie, I believe, have played Plus, which is a quick um, game. I think you played that on the ferry in 2019 after Essen. And that's a game that I was planning to self-publish. I might still do it in some regards, but even for prototyping, even for having a prototype which people can play, because you've got to say how many of this particular symbol is on the card, you have to be able to clearly identify that these symbols are the same. Now, in the very first prototype and in maybe the next four or five prototypes, I hand draw all of these cards because that's my style. I prefer to hand draw rather than print and cut out. Um, let's not take the time to analyze why that this is not the time. But by doing that, I was like, okay, actually a square might not be the best shape, but it's actually X's and circles and triangles. These are the three things that are a bit more distinguishable and saying, okay, and, but if I wanted to make it more representational, then for sure, at that point, I do need to have the graphics exactly printed. And that was actually the first prototype that I felt the need to print a version of because it had to be printed for utility. All these symbols had to exactly match. Without that, it just wouldn't be playable. And that's the thing. Um, we had a great discussion in the chat about utility and... By Robin, been lovely to have you, lots of love, um, who talks about double coding things. For example, Ticket to Ride, where they've got different colours of trains, but they all look different. For sure, double code that information. Charlie brought it up with Azul. It's not just that they're pretty. They actually serve a function, what these tiles actually are. And by the same token, if you think about how am I representing this to the player, I also wanted to bring up Quarkle by Susan McKinley Ross, where Susan McKinley Ross has gone on record as saying, well, I thought that the publishers might not have much imagination. They might do basically what I'd created. And I wanted to present them with the nicest possible components. And as it happens, they made components very similar to what I'd created. So it, be it was a really nice production. And yeah, in a bind, which was the predecessor of Yogi, which is now quite a successful game, it's there's definitely been some communication. Be, some because I wrote some illustrations, even though I would say that's a bit further along than a prototype, it's self-published. That uh, informed the illustrator, and there was a tiny bit of back and forth. I'm not going to say. You know, Simon Caruso definitely deserves all the credit for the art, but like little thing like putting the starburst in a different location, that was. And so having that sort of communication and thinking about, okay, what does that, how does that inform the gameplay? And having that understanding, I come from a place where, yes, I did go through, I was, I didn't get on well with my art teachers at school. I went to college and but I try to, as I'm making this prototype, often do some sort of illustration just as a vague notion of this is what the game might look like. Even if it's stick figures, this is the vague arrangement and it gives everyone an idea. And I think that's the most important thing, that you give the person an idea of what it might look like. Because yes, as Matthew said, if you make it easier for the publisher to imagine that picture then maybe it's more likely to be picked up i mean i just wanted and just to further that, like a slight counterpoint to what alan said um i recently was a judge for the cardboard edison competition for example which is probably my first experience i guess being like a publisher in terms of you know seeing pictures for, for many games at once and and i think you can't yes i think we all want to believe that we can act sort of rationally and you know somehow select you know see through it all the visual things and, and and see through to the game but i think it's just impossible with just and, and simply just with the volume of games at the moment um and again daniel solis who now works with a publisher with whiz kids um he actually said recently that 
you know, 10 years ago or whatever, he would give the advice like, yeah, don't worry about, you know, graphics, don't, don't hire professional illustrators. Um, you know, the publisher is going to see the game for what it is. But he says now on the other side, and especially with the growth in the industry, he said that he wouldn't necessarily say that anymore because you just see hundreds and hundreds of games and it's just impossible to be completely, uh, you know, un, un, you're, you're, there's, a, there's sort of a subconscious bias or, or, or attraction to things which look, you know, good to you, you know, subjectively. So, uh, yeah, I do agree. With you. Yeah, I do agree with you that then, Matthew. N nowadays, there is more of an expectation because it's because it's relatively easy to do things which look really, really quite quite swish. Um, I just wouldn't want to go too far down that route. Um, oh, absolutely. Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I have, been, I have been down. I mean, with Dolphin Adventures, I think we, which is a game which we spent about five years on. We went. I, I personally, I, I had a uh, disagreement with my co-author on it, and 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 he he was keen to do, you know, he was looking at how rounded the corners were of the cards and things like that, and, and, <laughs> and precise, yeah. absolute precise shading and adjusting. Now, I don't think that that was actually yeah. worth the effort. It did look. I mean, it looked quite nice. We didn't actually manage to place that game, unfortunately, um, but it did look very nice. But I would have, I would have preferred to concentrate more on the. Uh, the game design rather than on the um, graphic design for that. Um, so there was a there was a kind of there's a kind of limit there. Uh, but but we but we were able to do a really really good job on the graphics. But that that game that was a game, game that wasn't going to function without half it, decent graphics. It did in need it. it did need good graphics because it was all about color. Uh, it was about color and space um, specifically in the in the mechanics. So it did need to have good graphics. But you know you can go. You can go you quite can far. Go you can far. spend a lot of time on, yeah. on on things which probably won't influence the publisher at all. Um, but nowadays, you're right. I think there's an expectation. You've got a, a base level of good stuff rather than previously where you can have some sketches. Yeah. <laughs> and Alex talks about, yeah, could you make Rock Call color colorblind friendly? I mean, there's definitely the question of could you make set more colorblind friendly because that's one where you can't even really do text but i guess you could do something but i think that's maybe a question that um i'm going to sidestep slightly and dodge and put in a future um conversation where we have publishers coming on but well, we um, got our example was um for Tamer on that one charlie it was it was all it's all about um color color wheel and things moving around the color wheel and being next to each other and so forth but um we do have graphics on each color mm. and uh i remember sitting down at a, at a at a convention with some um people who were potentially going to buy it and they sat down and we said this is all about color and two of them at the table said well i'm colorblind um and uh we said well you know well explain it and you know see what you think and it was a game that you could actually explain to them and they actually went home with two copies of it because um they really liked it but, it had symbols but because it, it had relish. symbols that they could understand that worked and and could be were functional in in the environment and the graphics were such that they linked the colors and the and the graphics together so it, it could be played by people. It was a game about color that could be played by colorblind people. Mm. So, so that, that was, can be done. But that, that was Vicky. For sure. Yeah, Vicky did the artwork for that one. Yeah. I think um, Designer Cardboards has a really interesting point about graphics and rules informing each other. And that does lead me to the next thing, which is how much should the rules design inform the visuals? And how much, conversely, should you allow the visuals to inform the rules design. Um, who's happy to take this first? Matthew, you look like you're ready to go. Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think sometimes when you lay out, I, I think, I guess my the way I think about it is when you construct a prototype, that in itself will inform the design, especially very early on in the process where you, and, and part of that is, is trying to organize the information that you want in the game. And there are times where uh, that act of trying to put you, you look, wow, like, man, this this card has like three, you know, 10 lines of text. That's crazy. Who's going to see that on the other side of the table? Or 
or you you try and come up with a uh, like an icon. You're like, okay, I think these should be icons. You try and make the set of icons. You go, well, wow, this is this is really really difficult. I can't really tell the difference between these, or or I, you know, and yes, sometimes there is a kind of a like a expertise gap that you know potentially it would be possible, but but I don't have the artistic talent to do that. But it it I think it does. Um, it does get you thinking about how how it's going to appear as a product and and how it has to kind of be interpreted. And I think Charlie had the, the earlier point about playtesting, especially, is going to point out not just issues with the game, but it'll point out issues potentially with the graphic design and and potentially the illustration. And in some cases, the answer to that is not necessary to improve. I mean, you should improve graphic design generally, but but it may also speak to changes in the mechanisms that that will sort of like get rid of the problem of the graphic design or, or you know, the graphic design trying to solve a problem that it just can't do or it's trying to kind of like, you know, graphic design is a good way to organize information, but it can't sort of like, it can't, it's not magic. It, it, it can't, if, if there's too much complexity in the game, it can't sort of completely solve that. If you have a visual, you know, especially you have some of these games, uh, you know, which, which do have a great... Um, goal of trying to be for example language independent and they come up with such a complex symbolic language essentially uh that that unfortunately i think it, it fights against that and i and i think a great example is race of the galaxy sadly in some ways because it's it's uh it's an incredible game but completely incomprehensible the first time you play it essentially because they've tried to come up with this you know perfect visual language it's a very effective language in some ways because once you're experienced with it, it it's quite good but uh, you know, it's just ab absolutely incomprehensible uh, at the start. So, so yeah, I think I think that those acts can help you in the design process. Uh, yeah. So, um, for me, this is a very good point. Languages. So, I rather buy a game which has not that many um, English texts on it. Um, and having a good graphic, so uh, then uh, a game which I have English text and I can, I understand English, but sometimes the the things are very special. And so I have to ask somebody or Google somebody, I don't know. And if somebody tells me how the game works and then I see the, the graphic and oh, okay, this is um, this. And then I, I'm more willing to buy a game and yeah this was uh, i uh, i created a uh, minute work and it had it has a lot of text on it and we were thinking okay is it possible instead of using the text to show what it what is going and it was very complicated to make make graphics which exactly shows what you what you're going to do so we decided for better using a text yeah you after you oh okay um yes um i i, I definitely yeah definitely think that the, the visual design needs to reinforce and support the rules design and vice versa so it needs to be integrated um and um uh, the glory to rome is an interesting one because glory to rome <laughs> glory to rome is a serious game right but the visual design is is cartoony and it's not serious it's fun and and flamboyant and cartoony but the game is not a cartoony game at all it's quite a hardcore uh hand management and uh, whatever I, don't, I haven't played a lot of it but it's it's there's that there's a real uh it grates the fact that it's got cartoony artwork maximizing the potential of each card and you can go yeah, yeah, exactly it doesn't doesn't quite fit for me so that's an example of how it doesn't doesn't really quite work um but i think um i think that you, you can you can get you can get there by having a professional uh, input on both sides um so i mean when 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 we work with Vicky or other professional designers, we'll usually have a really good quality design brief, and a professional illustrator or graphic designer um, will actually ask the appropriate questions and understand the game, and then you know you'll you'll get a much better um, 
a, a much better result. I mean, I, 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 a long, long time ago, I, I worked with a graphic designer who wasn't a gamer, who didn't ask the right questions. And I was sufficiently inexperienced that I didn't really do a good design brief at all. And um, it was a war game. And we, we ended up with, yes, there was some terrain. Uh, it was a, a, you know, doing a painting of terrain. And it was, yes, it was a good painting of terrain, but it, it, it didn't really convey exactly what we wanted in terms of the game mechanics. because He didn't have any understanding of it. And I hadn't really briefed him well enough on that aspect of the, of the design. So having somebody who's a professional who knows how to ask the right questions, because it's all about visual communication specifically, uh, it's not about having it's not about having artwork. It's about having good visual communication, particularly in, inside the box. You might have you might have artwork on the cover, which could be well, literally nothing to do with the game mechanics at all, potentially. Um, although they'll still be layout, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but inside the box, all needs to be visual communication and communication with the world. So it needs to be the same style. Um, it needs to be something that something that the players will expect. And surprises, really, designer cardboard yeah. mentions Root, where they hid a coin game under uh, these cute graphics by Kyle Ferrin, I want to say, and Alex. But, yeah, I think that the public consensus is that for whatever reason, Root worked, whereas Glory to Rome, the original version, didn't. And, yeah. And Alex... Yeah, I know you did it to work on roots. I'm <laughs> not sure. Did I say that, Alex? Is Alex just trolling me? But um... <laughs> yeah, but... Um, I think that yeah, it's a bit like getting if, if you go have a graphic designer working on a game, you need to get a graphic designer who knows about games. It's the okay. same as um, a translator. Basically, mm. you can translate from one language to another, but if you don't know about board games, then your translation is not going to be a good board game translation. But I think in order to communicate that to <laughs> your play testers and in order to communicate that to your um, uh, potential publisher and in order to communicate that to your, to your actual designer, you have to have had some idea as you were going along. It has to have been integrated as, as part of the design. I'm afraid I'm the person at playtest meetings who always criticizes the, mm. the graphic design if I can't, if it doesn't talk to me and tell me how to play the game, the, even if it's, I mean, I don't care whether it's a beautiful square that has got perfectly right angle corners, uh, but if it should be a cross and it doesn't <laughs> work as a square at all, then I'm going to be the one who's going to comment on it. Because I, I can't play games that don't have graphics that talk to me, even as playtest games. And having the wrong colours. And having the wrong colours. So there is bad. nothing worse <laughs> than a playtest game where a designer has um, got uh, information in the colours that they're using. And yet they then print and then they print another version of it with only just a few of the cards because they didn't need to print them all on a different printer. Um, and then they upgrade a few, but not all, because they weren't all quite, you know, needed upgrading at that moment. And then print them again with a slightly different orange. And then you come out to you play testing a game and it's got six oranges and three reds in it. And it <laughs> says, oh, yes, you know, you make sure that all the pinks are, are doing this. And you think, pinks? What pinks? I didn't <laughs> see any pinks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I think I know yeah. what a designer that you might be thinking <laughs> And um, this is a very edge case. I don't think most people's heads work quite that way. But please be kind to your playtesters is what we're saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, a quick um, thanks for following Link. Um, Bones and Banners says, I fight with people that use too small text on cards. Going back to what... Matthew said, yes, if you've got text that's too small, when I'm writing things and I'm writing it in pen, if I can write it clearly in pen, it makes me think, well, presumably when it's actual text, then it can be clear also. Because if I'm trying to write it quickly, there's not the temptation of, oh, let's just drop a font size. Let's go to eight um, when I really should be using 12 or something. But um, I just definitely... 
sorry, my oh, no, sorry, sorry, Bez, I thought you were. Sorry. No, no, I, I just, just wanted to say, yeah, definitely. Um, it's all about having that setting up the original visuals again, echoing what Matthew said, then thinking about the rules. Does that mean that you need to simplify the rules? And then going back into the visuals, and it is a feedback. It's not just playtesting the um, way that the rules are in people's heads, but also the way that the rules are able to be conveyed to the players via the user experience, because that user experience is such a big part of the game, and I think that's what we're coming to more and more. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm really fortunate in my own to work a lot with Brett Gilbert as a co-designer with me, and, and he is very, he's not a graphic designer exactly by trade, but he, he, he certainly thinks in a visual and graphic way. And that actually is an incredible sort of iterative tool between us in that uh, it's always checking. And even a connection to Alan and Charlie, for example, like Snowdonia, I know that he, he was credited with the, the one of the ways in which the information is laid out on the Snowdonia board, uh, which sort of helps this sort of flow of, of gameplay. And uh, I wasn't there for that playtest, but apparently, but uh, he, he's, you know, he's almost as bad as a playtester in that he has no patience for things that he can't understand visually, I guess, is the point. So it very quickly makes you sort out prototypes. And having that, having a person like that, whether within the design team or within the playtesting team early on is, is incredibly valuable. I want to acknowledge what Nicholas is saying with old arcade machines. And this is actually really interesting because I was reading a book last night about old arcade machines, although I'm not as organized as Alan, I don't know which shelf it is on. What, you just can't reach behind you, Bez? Gosh, you're just not organized, you know. It's just... And here's something no. I prepared earlier, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 I have a carefully choreographed this. I'm but 100%, correct. I mean, like, you look at a game where they have these elaborate, lush graphics on the sides of the arcade cabinet, or on a Spectrum game, on the cover of the Spectrum game, you're not going to get just little pixels. You're going to get Horace and the spiders. You will get menacing spiders and this small figure. And then you go in and it's, okay, okay, I understand that these are meant to be spiders. But how can we... <laughs> oh, how can we make sure that they combine to create a cohesive experience? And, um, Charlie, are you happy to take this one first and um yeah i mean how can we combine it i, I, I mean i've got a good illustration i have a good example of it that i you have to have ready which i yeah. happen to have here this one he made earlier this 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 game here which is actually a miniatures game it's mission command normandy and vicky vicky dalton did the artwork for it and she advised me on the layout and uh, uh illustrations and things so this is actually a serious uh miniatures war game on world war ii stuff so we've got so of got, course from the perspective of the designer and before it yeah. gets to publishing yeah this, this well this is this is the published this is the published thing but but her advice her advice on it was keep it nice and clean and we went we we went for an evocative type of style which was supposed to be uh, uh it, like um uh, well, not uh, kind of 1940s, 1940s type of style of illustration. So we've got things like we've got things like this. So this is this 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 kind of thing is actually relevant for the game. That uh, on the on on the on one side of the page you've got an illustration of the mechanic of spotting things, and the actual illustration which Vicky has done on the other side is showing that it's actually quite hard to spot things in the Normandy landscape. So it's kind of reinforcing the point we're making in the rules, and that I think is quite critical. But it's also got that black and white. You know, this isn't this isn't um, color TV time. It's all to do with um, setting the scene for the for the for the uh, 1940s. And the, the 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 good advice. I mean, like like a lot of war games, we have um, tables and things like that. So we have some quite complex tables. I don't know if you can see these very. You uh, probably can't. They're a bit too, a bit too uh, blurry. But the, the point about these tables is yeah, that one is that upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Look the slick presentation here. So the the tables are all supposed to be nice and clean and easy to see, um, and 
very easy for looking things up. So it hasn't got lots of complicated graphical features in the tables. They are deliberately laid out in a very simple way without too much fussiness. And that was the kind of basic illustration. So uh, uh, that was the basic kind of design of the, of the, of the graphics that we used in it. So to reinforce the idea that what, what you're playing here is, although it's a complex game, it's a, it's a relatively straightforward thing once you get into it. And, and that's the kind of message we were giving. And it's all through this kind of 1940s style illustration thing. Yeah. It's, so a lot of the research that Vicky did on it was um, looking at period manuals and period books. Um, and having that professional approach really, really helps, I think, with the overall presentation of the, the package. So um, I was really happy with how that went. But and there was quite a lot of to and fro between you and her on that as well, wasn't yes. there? It wasn't something that you could say to the designer, go away and give me something that looks a bit nice and forty no, It was very much a back and forth to and fro. And was that something that influenced the rules at all? I mean, was there any back and forth on you as a designer or was it entirely on you as a publisher at that point? It was mainly, it was mainly me as a publisher, but... But the the style, the, certainly the, the, the typographic style, um, and how the uh, the typographic layout fitted in with the graphic design was very 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 important. Um, that that was absolutely vital, and that was at an early that was at an early stage. I think the important point there is that it was actually us both having to, to to talk about things a lot and exchange documents as well to make sure we both had a common understanding of what the language meant because she was dealing with it in terms of the language of a professional graphic designer, an illustrator, and I was dealing with it in the sense of a professional game designer. So uh, having that, working through what the meaning of a lot of those words was, was very, was very important. So what do we mean, what do we mean by a, a clean graphic design or what do we, what do we mean? So oh, yeah. If we take a step back and it feels like, um, as we talk more about this, it makes me realize that maybe um, once we've done all this, we'll have to have some fortnightly thing um, with Alan and a bunch of other people who are, yeah, continuing to do publishing. But from the point of view of a designer, I know there's never any clean break because it's likely that if you are interested in rules design, you're interested in at least somewhat in visual design. But my question is, was there anything that you had to do as a designer for this process or is there nothing? Because that might be the case. So I, I would say it's important um, as a designer. So if you, when you have a game and you, you play test it with your old graphic, with your prototype graphic, um, maybe it's good to uh, when the game is nearly finished or when you have the the, um, the illustrations from a publisher it is important to test again with the same group um, that you can see how they feel how how the game changes but it's also important to show the game to new testers and they are not um, they're not seeing the prototype before. So I think it's it's good for a designer to play test um, after it's um, it's uh, on the, uh, at the publisher, you test again. So normally I would say publishers do a great job, but I want to I want to um, be present. Be, yeah, yeah, and make my own experience and yeah. So, um, Charlie and Matthew, do you feel like there's any instances of rules? Can you think of other instances of rules having to be changed or informed by design, by visual design? Do you mean directly in our own projects or? or yes, just... um, or primarily in your own projects, but if you can think of other things that you can do in terms of 
making those rules to ensure that graphics can be integrated. It's that we're kind of setting it up for success. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing is that, it, you know, when you're trying to create... So we, you know, Brett and I have a card game that's being developed with a publisher at the moment, and it has, it's a card game with lots of different effects and things like this. But one thing that you realize is that if you want to have a sort of coherent visual language, and we, we hope, you know, we don't want the game to be too complex, and it, it, it makes you re-rationalize and uh, streamline the effects or to try and work out, okay, I have these two effects and actually they don't work the same way, but they're very similar. And having those sort of things, you, you, you realize, well, actually, maybe we should make sure that, that this is the same thing. We should get rid of this other effect or because it's very difficult to have, you know, it, it's just making the, jo the job of the graphic design that much harder by having two very similar but different effects. And it's hard to convey that. It's much easier to have, you know, uh, you know, it's more, uh, gr a greater difference between effects that can be clearly represented by different different graphics or icons. So I think that that iteration um, does lead to that kind of streamlining of, of effects and, and effect the rules of the game mm -hmm. so that, yeah, the graphics don't have to do as much heavy lifting or, you know, it's able to to be, you know, at the right kind of difficulty level. Um, yeah. Charlie, Charlie, do you have any thoughts on this? I think sometimes the thinking about the graphics before you've gone too far with the game design sometimes affects um, what kind of game you want to actually design. So if you can say, um, for example, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, a, a, an actual example, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. But um, you have a game um, where you're trying to say, well, there's there's these things I want to do with this set of cards. Um, and then somebody says, but those ones should be green and these ones should have something else on them. And, and, they will, and you go kind of, Oh yeah, that that's quite good. And now I can see how I want to. Um, I, if I was going that way, my rules would say something some, somewhat different. Um, I'm being really incoherent here, so it's not. If I could think of an actual example off the top of my head, I could. But I know that in the the times that I've encountered. Um, uh designers and we've been play testing and i've made lots of um visual comments usually they lead back to some kind of rules comment which usually leads back to some kind of visual comment and it it there really is quite a big lot of give and take and and uh, there has to had to be training at various times with various um designers who Please. shall remain yes. nameless yes. um mm -hmm. that actual um what you want to do with the way it's going to look at the end of the day can actually affect what how you're actually going to design the game. It, yeah, I mean, it reminds me of um, Magic the Gathering, which, um, sorry, um, someone, yeah, I know there's no actual Marrow counter, but how they've, are, they've got the luxury of having the in-house story team. And so they can start out from either direction and then do a little bit of one thing, do a little bit of the story. The story affects the mechanics. Okay, now we commission some arts work because, hey, we know we're making this set. We know yeah. we make four sets here or whatever it is at the moment. And then they get some of the artwork back. Then they continue working on the art stuff more. And yeah. having that luxury of being able to plow those resources in is kind of analogous in a way to, you know, the luxury of Alan and Charlie living under the same roof or, um, you know, the fact that I am able to draw things well enough that people actually buy them and consider them well drawn, but also invent rules to the extent that they considered are considered well designed that I'm able to have this back and forth in my own mind. But um, it feels like the answer it, or Brett like Ryan Lockhart, thank you. That's a perfect example where Ryan Lockhart actually starts off with a front cover of the box, is my understanding. They said that when they are starting a game, that's how they start. Okay. And that's the thing that grounds them. I want to move on because I'm aware of the time. And this feeds perfectly into my penultimate question, possibly 
final. At what point should art and graphics be considered or even commissioned? How do we set up a game for success without wasting time or money on it? And Alex asks, do you use existing artwork, whatever that might mean for a polished prototype, to enhance the theme towards the end of the process, for example? Let's go in clockwise order, starting with Matthew. Uh, can you give me just, uh, can you skip me? Sorry, I just, because I, I need, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> sure thing. Um, like I am, I will start off this thing um, and I will say that, um, yeah, just Nicholas says, yeah, any studio, once it's been set up, once you've got in-house people, I think that personally, for me, it's very, I would never pay someone to do artwork for me for a game that I wasn't 100% sure was going to be actually published. It just feels like if I'm pitching it, then asking someone else to, to, to spend time on it, then that's yeah, a bit more of a gamble. And maybe that's a bad mental block because at the same time, I'm willing to spend time on it because that is its own kind of mental gamble. But I don't think I have ever put in fancy artwork that had any utility beyond just the game is able to be played. If the game is able to be played more easily, I, I kind of think of it from the point of view of a playtester. What is essential for this game? What's essential to get this game across? In the case of In a Bind, before I actually self-published that, when I was playtesting it very early on, there were little stick figure drawings in every version that I actually created. And that doesn't mean that it has to be po polished, but it has to be something that the playtesters understand. And for me, that is my limit of this is what I'm willing to spend whatever on. And I totally understand people who are short on time, but a bit richer might feel like, you know what, I'm willing to spend a bit of money on this. Rita, you look like you uh, have something yeah, to say. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Bess. And so it is, of course, it's a gamble because uh, normally you have several prototypes and you show it to publishers and from 10 prototypes, maybe you get three, two, one or nothing published. So if you put money to the other prototypes before, then, then uh, how many money would you get after that all? So it's, uh, no, don't do that. Our situation is a little bit different in that I enjoy doing the graphics, whereas Alan Designs enjoys doing the games. So um, I wouldn't think that um, you'd ever want to to pay somebody to to do that, but I would do it as a, a hobby to improve some of those things. And let's face it, you probably don't want to send a um, game to a publisher with Alan's artwork on it. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> you, yeah. you have got better at that over the years, <laughs> but it's taken you a while. Harsh but fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes, I have the luxury of having Charlie who, 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 will, who will address the graphics problems and line things up for me and say, oh, that's ridiculously small or, you know, usual comments uh, that I expect. Um, so, uh, but, but I, I, mean, I have used, I have used existing art. I, mean, I have actually used, I, we, we, do we take things, we take things off the net and put them in yeah. for prototypes because sometimes yeah. it's easier to do that. And you, we know we're not going to use it in the final in the final game. We may not even use it when we pitch, but it, it looks good for playtesting. So it's real, from my point of view, it's the same. It's pitching, it's, sorry, communication to playtesters. And yeah. a quick shout out to Sammy Lixo. I don't know how to pronounce that, but I was unfamiliar with the Dale of Merchant series, to be honest. I've heard, but not investigated. Yes, another another sort of triple threat, like uh, it's all Ryan Lockhart's been mentioned in, or, or Alan and Charlie, you know, the triple threat team as well. No, I, I broadly, I mean, I, I, I've always been of spending it the least amount of money as possible, and I think I'd always, you know, say that to anybody starting out. I mean, speaking kind of personally now, I am in a bit of a different stage, um, you know, this being at least partly my profession, 
and I actually can would consider, I think, in a few cases where it would be worth uh, specifically paying maybe for a specific element from a graphic designer at the prototype stage. I think um, it depends on the prototype, but uh, for example, uh, you know, working on, it's not exactly the same, the crawler is working on like app-based games or a game where you're gonna have a hybrid game and app and a, and a, and a prototype. At that point, yeah, I, I would at some point consider, yes, um, maybe I'm going to have to hire someone specifically in the prototype stage to do some specific part. I'm not saying doing the whole thing, try, again, trying to minimize the costs, um, but there are times when you're pushing into new territory. And, and of course, it helps to get a publisher on early, earlier, and that's, that's kind of a good way of also circumventing you having to uh, pay for something yourself to kind of make the prototype. If you can, get, if you can kind of sell a publisher on the idea, that they might invest in that uh, early enough, but I think um, there there is sometimes a point where there are diminishing returns from you counting yourself. But I think for the most part of it, anyone starting out definitely don't. I, I think I'm just talking about there are. I'm finding a few specific cases in mind where I'm just like, yes, it, this would take me a week to try and work out what I think a good graphic designer could do in a, in a few hours, and I'd, 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 I I I would happily pay that that trade off is for me. A reasonable one but i i acknowledge i mean it's a bit of a different situation to most because it's an interesting thing like the whole at some point you might say okay is it worth me paying someone else to do this thing even though i could do it myself and as a self-publisher i have 100 percent done that with um this and i there is maybe a kitsy cataclysm box but with wibble plus plus deluxe not the original and Kitty Cataclysm. I got Denim involved to just put some files together that I had done before myself, but I was going through some I was finding it challenge for a challenging for a variety of reasons. And now I have Chris basically helping me one day a week on a Wednesday, and then we chat together from like nine until five-ish. And then Chris does a lot of the stuff that Chris does, the, some of it's better than what I could do. Chris is very good at photography. Chris, um, definitely having a second person always helps. But I guess um, it's always a case for what are you willing to risk? What is the kind of... Because if you're not trading off your time... Sorry, if you're not trading off your money, you're probably trading off your time in a sense, and Charlie made a really good point. What do you enjoy? I, early on, people said, oh, are you going to commission some artwork for In a Bind? And so I said, no, I'm going to do it. This was back when I was doing the prototype before it. I spent, you know, a few hours on each of the drawings, which is the final versions, and then that are no longer printed or anything. But it's, and then pe hopefully people are, oh yeah, this actually looks all right. And here I am. But I enjoy that. And it's not just something that, yes, there's a sense of could someone else do it significantly better, but also would I prefer to pay someone else or would I prefer to do it myself? It's all about how much do I enjoy it. And in the case of um, let's get these things together, I frankly asked Chris to do things like... Um, organize rhyming words for a game that I prototyped and might or might not publish as a basically print-on-demand thing at some points in the future, which is a poetry thing. And, I, yeah, sorry, I guess I'm just kind of underscoring how complicated the question is and not actually coming up with any answer. Um, does anyone else have any things to say about this? And the final question that I had lined up was, if we're self-publishing, is it ever too early to start pondering the eventual visual design? And my short answer for that is no. And I'm going to throw it open to everyone else on screen. So please um, help me close this up. Just whenever you're ready. Well, I'm never going to self-publish, so I, I, don't, I don't have much to say. So I just... <laughs> Charlie, Charlie and I would probably differ. I would say, well, I would do it when I got a first time. I would say no, never. <laughs> <laughs> it depends what I mean by visual design. Simple answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, whenever I'm designing, I'm always going to be thinking initially about what it's going to look like. But but 
that, as I said right at the start, that's just going to be, well, it's going to have a bunch of cards that are going to look really nice. Um, <laughs> you know, it might be something as simple as that. That's not really visual design. That's saying I'm going to have a bunch of cards rather than a board. You know, mm. so in, as somebody said in the chat, it's board games is a it's a visual it's a visual me medium, which is correct. So you're bound to look at it. It's just a question of how deep you look at it at which stage. And I I would leave that till later. But other people will. Well, I'd ask Charlie. It, depends, it does <laughs> actually depend what game you're designing. Yes, if you're designing Dixit, no, yeah, yeah, right. no question. If you're designing Mission Command, then maybe you can maybe leave it till later. Yeah. It's it's yeah. different kinds of games. It's a slightly different answer. I'm also not uh, doing self-publishing, so it seems like it's never too early to start thinking about these things, but it matters how specifically you think about it, what amount of work you put into it. And I know with some of the other shows I've said, we probably won't come to any conclusion. And yet again, that this seems to be kind of the recurring theme, that there's just a diversity of opinion. But I hope that there's been some sorts of takeaways. I hope there's been some sorts of utility. Um, Alex mentions Alex has released a few print and play games with their own artwork. Alex isn't very good, but the process of learning and improving illustration and graphic design has been really fulfilling. In which case, I've heard of people who spend a day on the first board and then are happy to throw that away and you know spend a day on their second prototype. And if that's you, then great. If you actually enjoy that, for myself, I would try to kind of scribble it out as quickly as possible for my prototype. But do what brings you energy because at the end it's kind of what matters to you why are you doing this are you doing this because you want to frankly even if you're doing it with a view to making money as those of us on screen have some inkling in our heads that we want to make some sort of profit based on these things we're still not trying to necessarily make money at the expense of happiness. It's about also what makes you enjoy your life, what's actually making you happy. And um, Cheap Sheep Games, hello, it's lovely to see you popping in right just as we're finishing off, says if your game theme is an important part of the gameplay, I'd get the artwork in early and play test with them, speaking as a self-publisher. Um, so let me move on and recap wrap up if anyone has any final words we can have them afterwards we have talked about doo -doo -doo -doo, visuals we talked about swimming we talked about bakeries we talked about a and yet schlecht is that how you say it um we talked about covers how covers can lead to sales about visuals bringing in immersion atmosphere about bringing clarity that user experience thing displaying what are you going for, that feeling, that emotion, setting that expectations, having an immediacy of how many icons you've got, talking about the potential overcoming language barriers, but being mindful of the cultural barriers where things are different. For example, the icons that Nicola said with the um, flare nostrils in the West, it can be seen as someone being angry, whereas it's meant to be someone being triumphant, like a bull going, hmm. Um, we talked about Quirkle, about being kind to your playtesters, about accessibility, about making sure that things are accessible, not just to the final people, but to your playtesters along the way, about having the visuals that you make your first prototype, you lay it out on some cards or you put things onto boards and then you might immediately think, wait a minute, this is too much or this one card has too many lines of text or this one thing can't quite fit. And maybe that leads you to simplify. We talked about, in the case of a specific game, simplifying collapsing two effects into one, thinking about what visual, what visuals inform what games will be designed. As Charlie said, we had some shout outs to Ryan Lockhart, Vicky Dalton, Braggart, um, Sammy Laxo, and but ultimately, it's about what do you enjoy? What are you trying to do? And that is the key thing. Like so many of these chats, 
delve into it's about what are you doing and why and um that is my recap and thank you alex i'm glad to hear that um let me give my own links and then um, if you want to check me out some stuff stuffbibbez.com stuffbibbez.com but, but honestly the one thing that i wish more people would the one thing i want to promote is the ldec twitter which do 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 where's my where's that gone yeah just um go and follow chris on twitter ell underscore deck but i can be found around the internet as stuff by bez also and let's start off clockwise and you will have to give me just a moment to bring up all the links and copy paste them i do apologize but do you have any final words, Alan, uh, Charlie, and Alan Paul? Um, do you have anything that you um, do? The thing that makes you happiest. Um, if it if it works for you and it works for your playtesters, and uh, it will most likely work for the for the publishers as well. Um, I would just obviously stress my 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 book of the fortnight. But I think the important thing about this one is visuals is a, is a is a separate language and having getting getting somebody involved who knows that visual language professionally is really helpful that's what i find anyway um, um and the reason i find it so helpful is because i have not got expertise in that particular area so i need to help with that <laughs> and you can be found at all of these places um, yeah benton fish on twitter um, or Spice Day on Twitter and Alan at Alan or Alan at Spice Day on Instagram. Um, yeah, I totally agree with uh, Alan and Charlie, and it was very lovely. Uh, both have you here. Yeah, and you can find me um, on Instagram, uh, Rita on Fire. There, I uh, post a lot of stuff of prototyping and games and i also have a german podcast called uh, spielen aufs ohr where where we play games and uh, yeah it was a it was a lot of a lot of fun uh, and nice to have you on on the the the, uh, the show charlie it was really, really nice uh having having your perspective on things uh and yeah i found uh, twitter is usually the easiest way wise goldfish on Twitter uh, and various other other places, yeah. And I was saying, uh, it feels like uh, Alan. After you say you need to set up your own, uh, we have weekly book club or something. You know, with on Paul or something. You need to have a new new segment. I think. Anyway, thanks everyone. And it has been lovely. I want to say um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Charlie, especially for it's been lovely having you on the show for the first time. I, um, Alan, thank you. Um, Rita, Matthew, as always, thank you very much. And everyone who's been amazing. Um, a special shout out to moderator Alex. Thank you for moderating. Um, but also Nicholas, Robin, um, J Fools Guard, Rune, like everyone, just thank you, everyone. It's been lovely to have you on. And the final section that I always ask is over to you. What are you up to? You can share, but only if you want to. So, what are you doing after this stream? Feel free to share anything, whether it's exciting or boring, trivial or important, you know, just anything that you're willing to share. Uh, we're getting a takeaway lunch, aren't we? Today? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. getting a wow, yeah, yeah. And after that, I'm painting the shed again. Oh, right, yeah, so <laughs> <there's a shed. laughs> which is paint, yeah. so much exciting things yes. to do. Yes, that's what great. color brown, brown. Yeah. <laughs> that exciting. exciting brown <laughs> for the brown shed, but yeah, it needed painting. So, mm. what can you do? Uh, Bess, hopefully you have a, a little bit time to talk about dinosaurs love spicy pies because tomorrow I would test it again. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, 
and I had to rush off midstream because there was a delivery, and it, I've just got a new box of board games, actually, uh, that I've ordered, so I'll be having a look at those and uh, looking forward to hopefully playing one of them today. Later. Exciting. And if anyone in the comments has anything they wish to share, then please do so, other than maybe talking to Rita a wee bit about dinosaurs loving spicy pies. Um, I might have a wee bit of... Um, yeah, comic book reading and trying to organize. I'll start to try to organize some of these massive piles of things. Oh, by the way, if anyone wants um, to have one of these, I like this um, Have one of these. Let me know. Um, Leagues of Gen Leagues of Adventure. It's from UK Games Expo 2011. It's you can't get it, but I've got um basically I yeah, I've got mm. two copies to give away. If you want it, let me know. No, um, thank you. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say uh, something fell off the back of a lor lorry or you know, like it's just <laughs> no, it's I'm trying to, I have a hundred hundred copies I need to sell at a low low price of five quid, you know, like <laughs> it's just if someone wants it, um like if you feel like you would be interested in I mean I don't know if you've Got one of these, Charlie? I don't think so. Would you I'm like not one? I'd be interested either. You don't <laughs> think you'd be interested? I mean, I'm keeping one of them for, you know, memories, but it. Anyway, so other than that, um, I am going to be doing a wee bit of Among Us. I'm playing that with some people tonight, and I'm also playing Balanceable at 8 pm tonight. If you're interested in my future streams, then please check out this link that will tell you that I'm playing Balanceable tonight, and I've got it all lined up for the next couple of weeks. Tomorrow, same time, 10 a.m. UK time with Etan, and then um, Musical Shenanigans, Fri Friendly Friday Forum, Mentoring Dutch Order, um, then on Sunday, reviewing the stream. So please check that out, share and spread the word. And what other people are doing is Alex is going to check out the copy of Click Clack Lumberjack that Alex found at the local charity shop. So, fingers crossed it is complete. That sounds awesome. That's quite a quality game. Just sent an email about some possible work before the stream. Hope it pans out. Fingers crossed for you. Heading outside and doing gardening stuff. I hope it's a lovely day for you. And for all of you... Thank you very much. If you are on Twitch, I am going to press buttons to make, to send everyone over to someone else, which will be um, Idol Michael. Um, please feel free to copy paste some or all of that thing. And that's the end of the show, unless anyone has anything left to say. Okay, well. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks. Thanks. It's been great fun. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. It was great. Bye 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 bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye 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 bye. bye, bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye 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 bye. This is the end of the show. Bye 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 bye. And now it's time to go to do bye 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 bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye 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 bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye bye. Bye bye. This is the end of the show. And bye bye. Bye bye. bye. And now it's time, it's time to, to go. go. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Embarrassing pause. Bye. Embarrassing pause. Bye. Yeah, embarrassing pause. <laughs> we'll say bye seven times more. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. See you soon. Uh, I mean, if you really want to, you can go off and tend to your lunch. Tend to early. Yeah, we just walk off, shall we? Yeah, <laughs> we could. <laughs> Uh, we'll see. Mr. N. Mr. N. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know we are. Oh. Uh. <laughs>
<laughs> What's your favorite? <laughs> bye bye. I heard of